first time I ever read a novel by an author who wasn't white, I was 15 years old. My family had just moved from the UK to Qatar, and being the book nerd that I am, the very first thing I wanted to know when we arrived was, where is the library? It was the summer of 1999, and my parents, two younger brothers and I, had packed up our entire life and moved halfway across the world to start a new adventure. We landed on August 1st, which if you've ever been to or lived in the Middle East, you'll know is the height of summer in the hottest part of the world. There was still about a month to go before the school year started, so we had some time before we could start making friends. But I wasn't worried, because books are my friends. And I knew that if I could just find a library, I would be fine. Finding a library wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be, but we did eventually find one. But this library was actually just a small room at a family club that we had membership to. Because the library was so small, they didn't have a big selection of books, so I couldn't find the usual types of books that I like to read. But I figured, that's okay, as long as I could find the biggest book they had on any topic, I would be fine, because a big book would take me longer to read and would help pass the hot summer days. I remember searching and scouring through the shelves, trying to find this big book until, bingo, I found it. I pulled it off the shelf and looked at it, opened it up to the back, because I wanted to see how many pages it had, and it had more than 700 pages, which is the biggest book that I had read up until that point of my life. This big book that I chose is one that I will never forget, for two reasons. First, because it was the first time that I ever read a novel by a black author. And second, because of its subject matter. It was a 1976 novel that told the story of an 18th century African, captured as an adolescent, sold into slavery in Africa, and transported to North America. And it followed his life and the lives of his descendants in the United States all the way down to the author himself. Does anyone know which book I'm talking about? Roots, yes! It was Roots by Alex Haley. Now, my favorite subject in school was history. And in the British schools that I went to, I remember we studied ancient Greece and ancient Rome, the Tudors and the Stuarts, World War I and World War II. But I don't remember ever learning about the history of European colonialism or the transatlantic slave trade. I didn't learn about systemic racism or global white supremacy, and I definitely did not learn about pre-colonial Africa. And then I found this book, Roots, by Alex Haley, and it opened me up to a part of history that was so violent and so dystopian and disturbing that it felt like fiction. It felt like a nightmare. It felt like something that should not have been allowed to exist, but it did. And not only that, but it happened to people who have the same black skin as me and who come from the same continent as my parents and my ancestors. Now, I don't remember a lot of the dialogue or stories in the book, but there's one part that always stuck with me. The black enslaved characters in the book were described as not having a soul, not being human in the same way that their white oppressors were human. And at 15 years old, I remember feeling confused at this idea that human beings could be thought of as not really human, 
just because of the color of their skin. Now, don't get me wrong. I knew that racism existed. After all, my own experiences from a young age, growing up as a black girl in a predominantly white society, had taught me that. But what I just couldn't wrap my brain around was this idea that black people could be thought of as not human at all. Dehumanization. What I realize now, at 37 years old and as an anti-racism educator, is that this dehumanization of black people, indigenous people, and people of color, which began before the transatlantic slave trade and is with us here now in 2021, is purposeful. It is systemic, and it is a threat to our collective humanity. But what I also believe, as a black woman writer and a lifelong book nerd, is that books written by black people, indigenous people, and people of color can help us to fight this dehumanization and help us to reclaim our humanity. Now, I've told you about the book that I read when I was 15 years old that changed my life, but in order for you to truly understand the significance of that event, you have to understand the entire context of my history as a reader. I've always loved books, but the books I've read haven't always loved me back. At age five, I was reading children's books about a little white boy and a little white girl called Peter and Jane, who looked nothing like me and my brothers. At age 11, I was reading Nancy Drew, The Hardy Boys, Agatha Christie, and a little bit of Sherlock Holmes. I was really obsessed with detective stories at this age, but all the detectives I read about were white. At age 15, as I said, I read Roots by Alex Haley. It changed my life. It was the first book by a black author, but it would be many, many years before I would read black authors and authors of color again. By age 21, I was reading personal development books, largely written by old white men. Somehow, I believed that they could help me, a young black woman, fight the anxiety and depression that I was experiencing at this time of my life. Then by age 30, I was reading personal and spiritual growth books, largely written by white women. Somehow, I believed that they could help me, a black woman, feel more empowered and feel more comfortable in my own skin. It wasn't until age 33 that things really changed. It was 2017, and in the aftermath of the white supremacist Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, I'd written an article that had gone viral. It was called, I Need to Talk to Spiritual White Women About White Supremacy. And it was the first time that I'd ever written a public piece about racism. It was actually a time of my life where I was coming into a deeper understanding about what it meant to be a black woman in an anti-black world. In the wake of that article going viral, I found myself suddenly thrust into nonstop online conversations with white people who were either inspired or enraged by what I had written. And very soon, I found myself very burnt out. Not just physically, but psychologically. You see, when you, as a black woman, stand in the public eye of a largely white audience that wants you to explain to them, show them, guide them, validate and forgive them, and somehow alleviate the feelings of helplessness and guilt that they're feeling on their anti-racism journey, it can leave you feeling so worn out that you feel like a shell of yourself. And what I soon realized 
after many months of these conversations was that I was actually reenacting the dynamics of white supremacy against myself because I was allowing myself to be used by white people for their gain, but to my detriment, instead of trying to find ways to heal and liberate myself from the impact that white supremacy was having on me. That winter, I decided to take a sabbatical, and I sought refuge in the one place where I can always find comfort and wisdom. Can you guess where I went? The library, yes. It was now 18 years later, and Qatar had built the biggest and most beautiful library that I've ever been to. I remember I went in there on a mission because I wanted to know what black writers and activists and thought leaders had to say about how to survive and thrive as a black woman in the grip of white supremacy. I submerged myself in these books, and it turned out to be this healing balm that I didn't realize I'd needed my entire life. I had needed children's books about little black boys and little black girls. I'd needed young adult books about black detectives. I'd needed personal and spiritual growth books written by black coaches, black healers, and black therapists. And now what I needed was feminist analysis, liberation pedagogy, spiritual nourishment, and just radical truth-telling that I could only get from black writers. So I dove into the work of writers like Audre Lorde and Toni Morrison and Octavia Butler and Bell Hooks and Maya Angelou and so many others. And through these books, I began to really see myself, see the ways in which I could begin to reclaim my humanity from white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, and these other interconnected forms of oppression. That sabbatical sparked for me a lifelong obsession with reading black writers and being a black writer. In 2020, I published my first book, Me and White Supremacy. I saw myself following in the footsteps of these literary ancestors who had come before me. I wanted to write a practical, interactive workbook for people who have white privilege to do the inner personal work of anti-racism. White supremacy tells us that people who are white or who look white are complex, multi-layered, full human beings who are worthy and beautiful and who deserve to live in the fullness and dignity of their humanity. Even more so if they're also male, cisgender, heterosexual, able-bodied, and wealthy. At the same time, it tells us that people who are black, indigenous, and people of color are broken, one-dimensional stereotypes, ugly, unworthy, people who have no humanity and who deserve no dignity. Even more so if they are also female, LGBTQ, disabled, and poor. White supremacy leaves no room for real humanity to exist because it tells us that white people are superhumans and the rest of us are subhumans. But this process of dehumanization actually dehumanizes both the oppressor and the oppressed because there's no way to hold on to your own humanity when you are dehumanizing another human being. Reading books by black authors and authors of color has become this rehumanizing practice that has completely changed my life. It's changed how I parent, how I love, and how I work. Today, I host a podcast and run a book club that centers and celebrates upcoming and contemporary authors of color. I do this work for two reasons. The first is purely self-serving. I was so starved of these books my whole life 
that I feel like I'm now rushing to make up for it. But the second reason is because I know I wasn't the only one who was starved. We all were. Writers of color have been writing essays and composing poems and telling stories since the beginning of human literary history. It's not because these authors and books don't exist that we don't get to hear about them. It's because they go against an agenda of white superiority, an agenda that says that the only way to be right is to be white. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we shouldn't read books by white authors. Hashtag don't come for me. Hashtag all authors matter. I still read books by white authors, and I enjoy them, and I get a lot from them, but they are the exception for me, not the rule, because I spent an entire lifetime reading white-authored books. I'm guessing you probably have, too. They are already overrepresented in our personal reading histories, and they are certainly overrepresented in our publishing histories. The book publishing industry itself is extremely white-centered, both in terms of who gets to work in publishing and whose books get published. There are also huge economic disparities between how much white authors get paid versus authors of color. In December 2020, an opinion piece ran in the New York Times titled, Just How White is the Book Industry? In it, the authors, Richard Jean So and Gus Wesereck, were trying to show these disparities. So they ran a study where they analyzed books, English language fiction books, that were published between 1950 and 2018. What they found out of the more than 7,000 books that they analyzed was that a whopping 95% of these books were written by white authors. It is completely unacceptable to me, and I hope it is unacceptable to you, that in a span of almost 70 years, only 5% of those books were written by authors of color. Now, I know it may seem right now, especially after the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020, that books by black authors and authors of color are now everywhere that those are the only books that are talked about, the only books that are published. But go into any mainstream bookshop and tell me who are the majority of the authors in those books. We still have a long way to go. And also, and this is something that I just feel very personally about, but authors of color shouldn't only be published or only paid well when they're writing about anti-racism or their trauma and pain as it relates to, to white supremacy. We should be reading them across a range of, of genres, whether they're talking about, whether they're writing about money, love, business, feminism, coming of age, politics, history, you name it. I want to read it all. We should all want to read it all. And we do. More and more readers of every race want to read books by diverse authors. Black, indigenous, people of color, have always wanted to be rendered more fully in stories and more truthfully in histories. And socially conscious white readers are looking for ways to break out of their bubbles and challenge their biased ways of thinking and reclaim their own humanity. This is what I believe about books. I don't just see books as words that are written on pages and that are bound between two covers. I actually see books as Portals, portals that offer us doorways into new ways of thinking and new ways of being. And I believe that books written by black people, indigenous people, and people of color help us to open doorways that lead us back to our humanity. Thank you. <laughs>